Hello and welcome to a new series and a new studio setting. As you can see, we've been having some renovations over the summer. Crime Watch remains the same, though. Instead of complaining or despairing about crime, in the next 45 minutes you can help to solve it. The programme's live, of course, the phone lines are open right now, and the police officers and BBC researchers here are waiting for your call. The number, 01811 And we have appeals on cases throughout the British Isles, and please do ring if you have some information on these or indeed any crimes. We've reconstructed three cases where the police especially need your help. A supermarket manager who woke to find gunmen in his bedroom and was driven 20 miles to open up his shop for a robbery. A young deaf woman who was found murdered in her flat and a series of attacks on elderly women in their homes. We have some pictures too from security videos and an Aladdin's cave of property, some of which might be yours. Calls to Crime Watch have so far led directly to 155 arrests, many for murder, armed robbery or other very serious offences. Our last programme before the summer break may turn out to be one of the most successful, but at the moment we can't give you many details because police think they're now closing in on a number of suspects. We don't have any definite results yet on the Inga Hauser inquiry or the Stoke robberies, but there is a new appeal that police want us to make on the murder of the dog breeder Joan McCann. Somebody rang the studio here in distress and she was on the line for almost ten minutes, and that call has now become the central feature of the inquiry. We're hoping that that person will have the courage to call again tonight. This is the number of the incident room at Wellin Garden City. It's 0707 33 And this is our number on the screen. So please use the same name you used before and please do ring. We appealed about a Datsun car which ran down a man who was setting cat's eyes in the road in Dorset. It killed him. The driver then accelerated away. But a Crime Watch viewer who worked in a garage had recently repaired a car that fitted our description and his call led police to a vehicle and to a man who's now been charged with causing death by reckless driving. And on photocall we had a passport picture of a woman who was one of a group which has defrauded a bank of almost £20,000. Friends of a woman who saw the programme persuaded her to go to Reading Police Station and she has now been charged with obtaining money by deception. This is John Lee from the BBC programme See Here, who's going to help us with our first appeal this month. But that's because, because our first case is about the last days of a 20-year-old from South Wales, Suzanne Greenhill, who was profoundly deaf. In other words, so deaf that she heard no sounds at all and couldn't speak. Now that's why we're making special efforts to communicate with deaf people throughout this sequence. They may be especially well placed to help with this inquiry. So, as well as the normal Crime Watch subtitles on CFAX, we'll have signing and extra captions too. Suzanne was engaged to be married. Her fiancé, Tony Wesson, was also deaf and she saw him almost every night. But she was fiercely independent and lived on her own in a rented flat. Our reconstruction begins on Friday evening, the 1st of July, in Newport, in Gwent. Tony Wesson was surprised to find Suzanne's curtains had been drawn. It was only 6 p.m. Hey, what's the matter? Yeah, I'm going. Suzanne, help! Suzanne had been raped and stabbed repeatedly in her neck and back. Forensic scientists and detectives experienced at scenes of crime described this as one of the most upsetting they'd ever had to deal with. Suzanne had lived here for two years and took great pride in the flat's appearance. Her life was sometimes lonely. She was isolated by her disability and shunned by some who found her deafness made them feel uncomfortable. She'd been born deaf and from an early age attended special schools. She remained close to her family and visited her parents and grandparents regularly. Suzanne went every Tuesday to the deaf club at Lady Hill Centre but she seemed happiest with her fiancé. <laughs> 
Several times a week, they went to the Newport Leisure Centre. Swimming was one of Suzanne's favourite pastimes. And Tony had persuaded her to join him weight training. She also joined him in another hobby. He's keen on model making, especially motorbikes. Ah. Good. Friends remarked on how happy Suzanne seemed when she and Tony were together. Suzanne was very fashion conscious, and a week before her death, she experimented with a different hair colour. She turned from blonde to henna chestnut. As far as the forensic evidence is concerned, across Suzanne's eyes was tape. And we know that this tape is the fast aid zinc oxide, five centimetre in width. A roll of that tape was sold at Wilcox Chemist in Malpas Road that week to a man with a plaster cast on his right arm. Detectives need to find that man to eliminate him from their inquiries. Another roll was sold at Watkins Davis Chemist at Bettis Centre to a man who wanted just a short length cut from a roll. And you haven't got anything less on the tape yet? Well done. I'll have to have it then. Yep, I'll do. The other piece of vital information we've had from the flat is a footmark. And this mark was definitely made by a person who was there at the time that Suzanne was killed. The mark is of a foot, approximately four and a half to five in size. And this would give us an average height size of five foot one, certainly no more than five foot three. It is possibly, and say possibly, an adolescent. And this foot mark was found in the flat in blood. Police have tried to piece together two elements of Suzanne's life who she knew and where she'd been the day she died. Some of her acquaintances have not yet been traced, and there's one man in particular detectives need to hear from. He was seen with her several times, at Sainsbury's, where he accompanied her shopping, at Newport bus station, where he went with her towards her home, and at Mays Glass Industrial Estate. Can I have a hot dog, please? With onions, sir? Do you want onions? Yes, please. If this is you, or you know who this is, please call us now. This is all that's known of Suzanne's last day. Between 9 and 10 o'clock, she met a friend and helped her with her shopping. She was also seen at Littlewoods in Newport Shopping Precinct. She came here often for morning tea and toast. At roughly 10 to 5, she was seen taking shopping home from Sainsbury's. And at half past 5, she was seen in Goodrich Lane. Hello, darling. Not knowing she was deaf, they thought her rather snooty. But then they saw her go to a garage, perhaps looking for her fiancé, and finding it locked, they saw her lose her temper. <coughs> what happened after that is still a mystery. Well, Glenn, we've seen from the reconstruction clearly most of what you need to hear. Is there anything else? Yes, Nick, there is. In fact, we have a new sighting of Suzanne. This is a sighting on the 27th of June. That's two days prior to her death. Uh, on that day, she was seen coming from the entrance to Shaftesbury Park, where a fair was being erected. That's what, a couple hundred yards from her home? It is indeed. This would have been about 8.30, 8.45. She was wearing very distinctive clothing. In fact, it's what's described as a hot pants suit, which was either pink or pinky orange. I would have thought that with clothing like that, somebody in the fair would have seen her. And we're asking anybody at the fair who saw her, and in particular, anybody who saw her talking to any, any male person at the fair to contact us. As it happens, there's another link with that fun fair. In fact, two separate sightings that could point to the same man who might be the killer or might need to be eliminated. 
at around uh, midnight, in fact, on Wednesday the uh, 29th of June, the day that uh, Suzanne died, this travelling fair was still setting up due to open the fact the next day. And workers were surprised to see a car drive into the park at speed and later drive away down Evans Street. A couple of hours later, another witness remembers seeing a man in a blue check shirt walking along the junction of Evans Street and Shaftesbury Street. He got into a dark coloured Mark III Ford Escort and did a fast three point turn. And the witness remembers that the car had a tow bar and the registration number began, they think, A59. Obviously, you've got to eliminate whoever was driving that car, whoever that was walking there. Anyone else you need to eliminate? Yes, that is correct. We're very anxious to trace the driver of that car. We're also anxious to trace a man who came into our inquiry very early on. This man went into a fish shop, a fish and chip shop in Cross Keys. He had blood on both his arms. Um, he appeared to be intoxicated, but didn't smell of drink. Um, now, this man, um, we are very anxious to trace. We've got a video fit of him. Describe him for us, will you? Yes, he was six foot in height. He had mousy brown, curly hair. He's described as very, very slim an age between 20 and 25 years. You've had a, a lot of help, I know, from the local community and from the deaf community generally. We have. The deaf community and the neighbours of Suzanne have been particularly patient with us and very helpful. But we are sure, absolutely positive in fact, that there is more vital evidence out there. And we would appeal to anybody who has any evidence, however small it may appear to them, it could be vital in our inquiry to bring Suzanne's brutal killer to justice. If you knew Suzanne any time in the last couple of years, do call us, 811-8055. And we have a separate number for the deaf or hard of hearing. That's 01811-1066. And it's equipped with Minicom phones, which allow callers to type and read their messages. Now, that's only for the deaf who have Minicom or Vistel phones. The number 01811-1066. Or you can call the Main D police station direct, that's using ordinary phones, on 0633 244 999. That's 0633, the code for Newport, 244 Well, now some more news on previous Crime Watch cases. In November last year, police on Merseyside asked Crime Watch viewers to help to find a man who'd assaulted two young girls at knife point in the Merseyside area. A police officer in the West Midlands recognised the video fit. It was a man he'd recently arrested for sexual assault in Birmingham. Last month at Birmingham Crown Court, the man was found guilty of a series of sexual offences and sentenced to life imprisonment. Last December, we showed a disturbing reconstruction of an armed robbery on a farmhouse in Cheshire. After the programme, Cheshire police were called to see three men who'd been arrested by police in Manchester. Detectives were struck by the similarity between one of the three and a crime watch video fit. As a result, further inquiries were made and the three were charged and pleaded guilty to robbery. And from our programme last February, you might remember the case of 60-year-old Cathy Walsh, who was murdered at her home on 25th of, uh, 21st of October in 1987. She was well known in Tooting in South London, where she'd lived for over 30 years. A man has been charged with her murder, and he's now in custody, awaiting trial. Now to incident desks and brief appeals from round the country. Wiltshire police are hunting for a fraudster who's conned his way across Britain. Leicestershire police are looking for armed robbers who hijacked a lorry load of high-class clothing. And the Metropolitan Police have new evidence about the crossbow killing of Diana Moore. Here's Superintendent David Hatcher. First, that murder of the 36-year-old executive Diana Moore. She was shot with a crossbow on the 20th of July outside her flat in Woodfield Road, Ealing, West London. Tonight, we can reveal details of the crossbow which we believe killed Diana. The weapon was probably one of these, a Barnet Trident and it must have had an attachment like this. That's the 75 pound Magnum Prod, which makes it one of the most powerful handheld crossbows available. If you know anyone who bought one of these items in the London area recently, please call us. And we're still appealing for information on a man who was seen with a crossbow just 100 yards from Diana's home two days before the murder. He was described as between 19 and 21 years old, about five foot eight inches tall with cold, hard eyes. If you know who he is, please call us now. My colleagues in Kent need to trace a team of armed robbers who attacked a post office van in North Fleet Gravesend. 
About 2.30 p.m. on Thursday, the 21st of July, a post office van was making a delivery to this sub-post office in Haynes Road, Northfleet, when two robbers forced one of the guards back into the van and told him to drive to nearby Newhouse Lane. There, the two men took £18,000 in cash and got into a white Austin Montego turbo driven by an accomplice. It was rammed by a passing motorist who saw the robbery, but he couldn't stop them hijacking another car and driving off. What the raiders didn't realise is that they were photographed during the robbery. One is in his 20s, 5 foot 10 inches tall, slim with a growth of stubble. He wore a green and yellow ski jacket. The other man is in his early 20s, 5 foot 10 tall with dark hair and a growth of beard. Witnesses say he's ugly with odd teeth. Both men wore glasses, possibly a disguise. If you recognise them or have any information about the robbery, please call us. There is a reward. We're making a special appeal for anyone who knows this man, suspected of raping two children in Canterbury at the weekend. He's plump with greying hair, short, dirty fingernails, and more spectacles with thick lenses. If you think you know him, call us now. Half a million pounds worth of Burberry clothing like this is still missing after a robbery on the 15th of June. A lorry carrying the Burberrys was driven from Leeds down the A1. The driver stopped near Greetham in Leicestershire at a cafe called Jan's Caf. There he was attacked and bundled into a white Suzuki or Honda van. We think the van went in convoy with the Burberry lorry and continued down the A1 to London where the lorry driver was dumped near Barkingside High Street. His empty lorry was discovered two weeks later in Canning Town. There were three robbers, all described as white with London accents. This one had a gun. He's thought to be in his mid-thirties, five foot ten inches tall, well built with neat dark brown hair and a beard. One of his accomplices was referred to as Mick. Now, there are imitations, but genuine Burberries like these have a distinctive horse mark on the neck label. A coat like this sells for about £370. So, if you've seen any for sale at a much lower price, or if you know anything about the robbery, please ring us. Wiltshire police are looking for this man, who's definitely made his mark on the map. He's wanted for questioning in places as far apart as Penzance and Durham about more than 40 crimes of fraud and deception over the last two years. His real name is William Morris Hardy, but he's also been known to call himself David Norman, David Griffin, Max Refson, G or R Furnival, Mr Ronson, Marcus Velody, Morris Davigdor Mendoza and even Michael Parkinson. Hardy is 47 years old, 5 foot 10 inches tall and stocky. He's smartly dressed and speaks with a slight foreign accent. Do you know where he is now? If you've any information then please call us. Number if you can help with any of those cases, 811-8055. Well, our next reconstructed case is an armed robbery two months ago at a frozen food supermarket in Liverpool. It was such an ordeal for the manager there that he's now given up that job altogether and moved out of the Merseyside area. The store has, of course, now changed its security arrangements and our reconstruction begins in Liverpool. This is the Iceland frozen food supermarket in Walton Vale. On the evening of Friday the 8th of July, the store was closed. But in the stockroom, two assistants were working late, packing away a delivery with the store's manager, Miles Simpson. Have you done that last sort of cans then, Tony? Yeah, it's the last one. Good, well, I think that's enough for today. We'll finish off on Monday. Go and get your stuff and I'll go and set the alarm. Miles had been made manager of this branch just last year and he was commuting to work from Wigan, 20 miles away. It was 20 past nine when he finally locked up for the night. Well, thanks very much, lads. Uh, do you want to lift home? No, we'll wait for the bus, thanks. Bye then, lads. Hey, good night. Miles always parked his Renault in the street opposite the supermarket. But as the two boys waited for their bus that evening, they saw a blue Ford Granada pull out from round a corner and follow Miles's car. Look, John, that car there. It looks like it's following Mr. Simpson. Can I get his number, please? The boys saw part of the registration number, including C and 91. 
but Miles, driving home that night, didn't notice anything unusual. It's 9.30, Eleanor Aldroyd reporting. Operations to put out the fire on the Piper Alpha oil... The next morning in Liverpool, these two men were the first customers in the Soldier of Fortune military shop in Victoria morning. Street. Got a pair of handcuffs. Uh, do you want the 11.99 or the 5.99 ones? The 11.99 ones. He was suspicious as they paid with a £50 note. Haven't you seen one of those before? Late that same night, Miles was relaxing at home, tired after a busy Saturday at the supermarket. Wake up. You've seen one of these before, haven't you? In Dirty Harry, the movie. Oh, no, I haven't. Do exactly what you're told and you won't get hurt. What the hell's going on? We're going to take you with us. We want the money from the store. Where are the keys? What keys? The store keys. What the downstairs? Where? On the coffee table. Before they left the house, Miles was forced to explain how the supermarket alarm system worked. Outside, a third man was waiting in the car, which Miles thinks may have been a Volkswagen Golf GTI. They drove the 20 miles to the supermarket in Walton. And during the journey, Miles remembers one of the robbers mentioned the name Joe. It would have been about two o'clock when the robbers arrived here at the Church of the Blessed Sacrament, which is next door to the supermarket. Miles was blindfolded and taken into the churchyard, where one of the robbers guarded him. The other went to the supermarket to turn off the alarm. Him to open the safe. Yeah, okay. When we get to the street, I'm going to be behind you because I have to take my ski mask off. Just keep your eyes straight forward if you see anyone act dead cool like we're two mates coming out of a club, all right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Come on. At about this time on a Saturday night, the nightclubs are closing, so there were still some people around in the high street. Miles is six foot eight. The robber only five foot six. Maybe you remember seeing them. Miles himself remembers one man passing them, and police are still anxious to trace him. Hold it there. Right. Come on, will you? There, so. Right, right, give us your hands. Right, over there, down there, sit there, and not a word out to you. We're going to wait for the car. Don't move from here until the police turn up, or we'll kill you. They got away with about £8,000. Well, Detective Superintendent Tony Bailey is in charge of the case. Do you have any descriptions of the men now? The descriptions of the two men are about 5 foot 6, 5 foot 7. They're both white males, um, 30 to 35 years of age, and described as fat and stocky build. Right. They, the robber and the manager must have looked very odd together then that night. Yes, when they were walking from the presbytery to the shop, 
prior to the offence being committed. The manager is six foot eight tall and very slim. The robber is five foot six and very fat. And at one stage he had his arm round him. And we do know that um, one person was passing and we would like that person to come forward or any other person who has seen this odd couple walking in Waltonville at that time of the night. Right. Now, there's a sequel to the story. <coughs> uh, we're now looking at uh, Livingston Drive in the Sefton Park area of Liverpool. Ten days after the robbery, a man discovered that the lock on his garage had been changed. When he finally broke the lock, he found a black Golf GTI with these number plates. And you and your colleagues believe it was the car used for the robbery. The GTI was the 16 valve, which have only been made for the past 18 months, but the plates were A-red, so that doesn't tally, does it? They don't know. The plates A-registered in order the cars, four years old at least, and the 16 valve GTI, as you quite rightly say, was only made 18 months ago, so it would prove that there were false plates on this car. And if anyone has seen this car, or seen the car in Livingston Drive in these garages being put in there or driven around in that area, would they please contact us? Right. And what about the other car, the blue Ford Granada, seen following the manager the day before the robbery? Yes, this had a logo on the back which just had Granada. Now, the only car that Fords make with Granada on the back is the Scorpio, which is the top of the range. So it could either be a Scorpio or it could be a, another Granada with the other part of the logo, such as the gear or the 2.4, 2.i missing. Right, so remember the number plate was C something <coughs> 91 something. Yes, that's correct. Right, Mr Bailey, thank you very much. There's a reward of £10,000 if you have any information which you think might help police and lead these police to these men. You can ring us here in the studio on the usual number. It's 01811 8055 or ring Merseyside Police Direct on 051 709 6010. That's 051 for Liverpool, 709 6010. Telephones uh, have been uh, busy but uh, nothing uh, very spectacular at the moment. We have one name, though, put forward in the Suzanne Greenhill case. We'll let you know if anything more comes of that. In April's programme, we showed a photograph of a man who was wanted for questioning about a company in Yorkshire. It had been advertising holiday cottages around the country, but that company uh, disappeared, owing money to nearly 2,000 people. A viewer recognised the face we showed, and as a result, a man was arrested last week in Torquay and has been charged with conspiracy to obtain money by criminal deception. In February, we showed a security video of a woman who loaded up a supermarket trolley in a London Sainsbury's home base. She barged out of the store into the car park without paying. And as a result of calls from several viewers, a woman was arrested on June the 14th and she's been charged with theft. In January this year, we reconstructed a break-in at a post office in Salisbury in Wiltshire. The gang had brought with them a collection of specialist equipment to break into a strong room. But as a direct result of the programme, two men have now been arrested and charged with the offence. The scope of the investigation has since extended to cover a number of other offences of burglary. Police would now like to hear to, from uh, another man, uh, Anthony Peter Walsh, although he might not be using that name. But he might be able to help them with their inquiries. Do you recognise him or know where he is? If so, please ring us straight away. Here's the number, 811 8055. Well, now, our Aladdin's cave of stolen treasures comes tonight from the vaults of Guildford Police Station. But the property you see may come from burglaries all over the country. And in fact, if you can identify any of these things, you may help police to charge one particular gang with a whole series of robberies. Genie of the Lamp, as always, is John Bly. Thank you, Sue. This is without doubt the most important Aladdin's cave we've ever had to look at, ranging from an early and extremely rare piece of tapestry, some fine miniatures and some quality paintings. It all seems to me rather young to have one's wings clipped, but it's a good picture. But what I want to show you in detail is some of the silver. Now, this tankard was made in London in 1761. It was engraved and presented to the Reverend T. L. Thoroton in 1828 for the best pan of tulips at a Knott's flower show. And the mug next to it went to the same good Reverend for the best pot of carnations. Now, next is a little gem, but it's easy to miss. This little pot, made in the form of a bunch of bamboo, was made in London in 1770, and this actually is the original bamboo handle. But the star lot has got to be this pair of chamber candlesticks made in London in 1821. These were used to light the gentry to bed, and what superb quality they are. They're cast silver, a wonderful date, wonderful quality, and I suppose today worth best part of three and a half thousand pounds. Anyway, now to some furniture. And we've got some papier-mâché. First off, a workbox on stand. Easily identifiable as being after 1835 with all this mother of pearl set in the top. Quite a plain interior, but still worth £1,500 today to a collector. 
Again, for the best, though, papier-mâché at its very best. A revolving top tea table, which also tips up and shows you not only this wonderful painting in the style of Landseer, <clears throat> but the fixture that enables it to turn is at one time gilded brass with these L-shaped hinges and the original clip. All those go to make an extremely rare thing worth best part of £4,000 today. Now rapidly past the French commode onto a delightful little piece of English furniture made in the style of George II period. It should have been made around about 1740. It's wonderful quality, lots and lots of shape, a collector's item if ever I saw one, but made slightly out of period, but nevertheless something I would very dearly love myself. Now you know they never give me enough time on this programme, so in all haste we've got to look very quickly at a grandfather clock, which is a marvellous example, a stick barometer in mahogany about 1780, most important of all, a ship's barometer on its original gimbal. And now, for a musical ending, we're going to look at a late Victorian musical box with marquetry panel in the top. Inside, you'll see from the label, it plays ten tunes, one of which we're going to have now, and I hope that strikes a chord with somebody. And the number to ring, if you recognise anything, is 01811 Or you can phone Guildford Police Station Direct on 0483 301 717. That's 0483, the code for Guildford, 301 717. Over the past year, there's been a series of attacks on elderly women living alone in Surrey and North Sussex. The police have now started a major inquiry and they're extremely anxious to catch the attacker before any more people come to harm. Leading the investigation is Detective Chief Inspector George Smith. In November in Crowborough, um, a man got in through an open window to the flat of an 80 year old woman and raped her. Uh, he then stole her money before making good his escape. Very poor description, but the Peeping Tom was seen in the area that same evening. We have a very good description of that man. The second uh, attack occurred in Horsham in February. Circumstances very similar. A serious sexual attack on an 80-year-old lady. Uh, the offender also stole money. Again, a very poor description from her, but a man was seen in a nearby pub. Now, that man was drinking a most unusual drink. Evening. Can I help you? Brewmaster and Pompey, please. Brewmaster and Pompey. Yes. In April, we had a third attack. This took place in Crawley, very similar to the other two. 18-year-old victim, she was raped, but on this occasion, the man used a knife to threaten her with. Uh, by this time, we established a pattern had been developing. So once a pattern has been established which links separate crimes, an incident room like this is set up. It uses a computer system called Holmes, the Home Office Large Major Inquiry System, and it brings together all the information from separate crimes and then searches for any possible links. Amongst the police officers brought into the investigation are women officers. They can help the victims through the shock of their traumatic experiences, get to know them better, and obviously to learn as much information as possible about the attack. Fingerprinting used to be thought of as the only method of identifying a criminal, but at laboratories like this, they can make up a genetic profile of any criminal. We get a genetic profile from the DNA within our cells. Most of our cells contain DNA, and it's often thought of as the blueprint of life. So essentially, we have to extract the DNA from the cells themselves, and then having done that, we cut the DNA up into little pieces. This makes it much more manageable. We separate those pieces out according to their size, and having done that, we then identify those pieces that are extremely variable, and it is those that we would look at with DNA profiling. In this case, which has been dealt with, we have semen from three scenes, and you can see that in each instance, the semen gives the same pattern. Mm. The profiles are the same. The chances of this happening are one in many millions. So we can confidently say that the semen has originated from one man. But of course, we still need the police to bring us a suspect. As well as a physical profile, the police can now use a psychological profile. The FBI in America have interviewed many convicted criminals. And after talking with the Sussex police, they've come up with what amounts to a photo fit of the mind of the man they're looking for. It's been suggested that possibly we're looking for a man who lives with an elderly relative perhaps an aunt, and he has a strong attachment to that person. Early 20s, a loner, an introvert, 
a man who has very little interest in his own appearance. Certainly not an athletic type. Even having a solitary job, one who doesn't mix with friends. Immature sexually, the sort of person who would sit at home reading pornographic magazines. If he had a girlfriend, and there is an if, um, it is suggested she would be much younger than himself. In fact, he's young as 12 or 13. In May and June, there were two further attacks here in North Sussex. A total of five in a 25-mile area. In one of them, the victim's light was left on and she was able to describe her attacker well enough to help the police create this artist's impression. This time he was wearing a beige sweater and berry. You, in fact, frightened off your attacker, but can you tell us what happened? Well, I woke up at three o'clock in the morning and this man, strange man, was on my bed. Of course, I was terrified. I had his hand over my face, holding it, said I couldn't breathe, I thought, but I struggled and got away and screamed and screamed. And when he heard me screaming, he was frightened and ran away. I'm doing this in the hopes that it will perhaps catch him and save some other lady not so strong as me not to have it happen to her. Valerie, you've got to know the victims well. How have they all managed to cope with their dreadful experiences? They've had a lot of support from their family and friends, which has made my job a lot easier because I have to visit them on many occasions and become friends with them. But I must never forget that I am trying to find additional evidence that might help us find this offender. What could they have done to protect themselves? Perhaps a personal alarm system by their bed, window locks, always close your curtains before you put the lights on. There is a free crime prevention service with the police force. If you see anything at all that is strange, please contact your local police station. George Smith, a frightening series of attacks, the sort that creates universal revulsion, including yes. right across the criminal fraternity, everybody. Five attacks featured in that reconstruction. Yes. Just take us through when they happened and where they happened. Yes, the first attack occurred in Crowborough in November of 87. The second one in Horsham in February of this year. Then there were two further attacks in Crawley in April and May. Then in June in Hawley. Then, in fact, after we finished the filming, there was a sixth attack in Rygate. That was during the early hours of Saturday morning, the 27th of August. Now, you say in the early hours of Saturday. The interesting thing is all these attacks are in the early hours of Saturday. That is late Friday night. Yes, that is very interesting to us, all between midnight and 2.30 a.m. So it's somebody who has access only to go out on Friday nights, perhaps, or finishes work on Friday night. The description is very vague, very, very briefly to yes. us. Yes. 20 to 30 years, 5 foot 7 to 5 foot 9 tall, slim build with a thin face. Now, the vital clue on the last one, he had a full beard without a moustache. Um, so he's obviously grown a beard during the last two or three months. OK. Friends, neighbours, relatives, anyone with any suspicions, please do call us. Here's the number, 01811 8055. Or you can call the incident room in Crawley in Sussex. That's 0293 24242. 0293, the code for Crawley, 24242. Well, now to Photocall, where we show pictures of people who have been seen on security videotape or on camera and whom police would like to see in person for questioning. Here's David Hatcher again. First, we'd like your help to find this man, Barry Richard Mackay. We think he might have important information about the murder of 33-year-old Elaine McGee, whose body was found on Tuesday the 26th of April here at her home in Murdishaw, Runcorn. She died after a brutal beating. Elaine was last seen two days before on Sunday the 24th of April, and that night neighbours heard a violent row at her home. Mackay was an ex-boyfriend of Elaine's and was seen in Runcorn that day. Take a good look at him. He's 38, 6 foot 2 inches tall and slim. Unlike this photo, he may be clean shaven. He has a distinctive Liverpool accent and tattoos on his arms and shoulders. If you know where he is, please call us. On the 20th of August, a woman tried to cash a fraudulent cheque in a North London branch of Thomas Cook. She was unsuccessful, but an hour later did manage to get a traveller's checks at another branch. She could be connected with four burglaries in Flittick, Bedfordshire, on the 19th of August, and we think she's got over £5,000 in the last month. She looks Asian or Mediterranean, about 35 years old, 
five foot two inches tall and is slim with long, dark, wavy hair. If you know her, call us now. Early this year, this motorcycle courier was photographed leaving a building society at Aldgate, London. He's known as Mark Geraghty, and he's just signed for a large withdrawal on an account he recently opened in the name of Bradley Martin Associates. This is a bogus company that defrauded Citibank in Lewisham of £60,000. Bradley Martin Associates' address was, in fact, Mark Geraghty's rented flat. Geraghty claims to be from Zimbabwe. He may have trimmed that hair by now. Citibank are offering £5,000 for any information that leads to arrest and conviction. And finally, do you recognise this man? His name is Kenneth Smith, and until recently, he was the chief cashier at Sunderland Railway Station. He might have information about the theft of £25,000 from a safe at the station on the 18th of August. We know he was in Edinburgh on the 19th of August in this car park on Prince's Street West, but where is he now? He's 35, over six feet tall, with dark hair. If you've seen him or anyone else on our photo call, call us now. And if you recognise any of those faces, that's the number 01 811 8055. 01 811 8055. And we've been receiving a lot of calls on that number throughout the evening. We've had quite a lot of names suggested here uh, for the Canterbury Rapist, so police are following that one up at the moment. There have been sightings of a man with a plaster cast on his arm in the case of the Suzanne Greenhill murder, so that's being followed up as well. He might be eliminated from their inquiries by the end of this evening, with any luck. Uh, a great many calls on William Hardy, who was wanted in connection with some frauds suggesting possible sightings of him and possible other names. And an anonymous caller has given a name in the Merseyside kidnap case, and we'd like that person to ring back, please, if you can, 01811 If anybody has been trying to get through and can't, please do persevere. You'll find all the relevant local numbers on CFAX, if you have that, that's on page 186. Or you can write to us at Crime Watch BBC TV, London W12 8QT. The lines are open till midnight. And of course, if you have any information on any crime, you can just call your local police. There is one other way you might be able to help. There is around here an assortment now of weapons already have handed in under the current firearms amnesty. If you know the whereabouts of any unlicensed shotguns or any other unlicensed weapons, you can now take them into a police station and leave them there. No questions asked. So don't let these things fall into the wrong hands. The amnesty continues for another three weeks. We'll be back in another four weeks, the first Thursday of the month. And if you want to hear what's resulting from the calls that are coming in right now, we'll be back here with Crime Watch Update after the film at 10 to midnight. If you can't stay up till then, don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night. Well, welcome back, and since we came off the air an hour and a half ago, we've had a good many calls on nearly all tonight's cases, and particularly quite a lot of people have recognised belongings on Aladdin's Cave, but more about that later. Yeah, John Lee is with me, because earlier tonight we reconstructed the last days of a young, profoundly deaf woman who lived in Newport in South Wales. Her name was Susan Greenhill. She was last seen alive on the 29th of June. It was a particularly unpleasant, savage stabbing to death. Uh, Bill Glynn, you've had, I know, a lot of calls, but anything concrete from them? Yes, we've had over 100 calls, Nick, and I'm very, very pleased with the calls that we've had. There are a lot of things for us to investigate. However, a lot of the calls have been anonymous. Uh, and one of the calls in particular, in fact, two of the calls, but one in particular, we would certainly like the person to contact us. Tell us about that. 
we've had a call from an anonymous female. It was a very brave thing to do, but she's called us and told us that she was um, indecently assaulted by somebody from a fair. Is that the fair that was being set up next door to, or very close to where Suzanne lived? Presumably so, yes. Um, we would certainly like her to contact us again. We realise that it's a very sensitive thing to do, and uh, obviously we respect her wish to remain anonymous. If she would like to meet either myself or a policewoman, then if she calls us, then we would be prepared to meet her anywhere at any time. It's hard to stress how important this inquiry is. Well, it is extremely important. This person has killed once, and obviously there's nothing to suggest that he may not kill again. What about the second anonymous call you really want to trace again? Yes, the second call was from a person who also remained anonymous and said that, in fact, a friend of his was the person responsible for Suzanne's death. We would certainly like him to contact us again. He's given a name, I gather. He's given a name. But that's not enough? Well, it's, it will make it extremely difficult for us. If he wishes to remain anonymous, then he can do. But you need, what, height, what he looks like, where he lives, roughly? Well, if he can give us any more information concerning this man, then obviously it would be very, very helpful to us. All right, Ms. Blinn, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <clears throat> well, we've had a good response, I believe, to our reconstruction of the robbery at the Iceland frozen food supermarket in Walton Vale on Merseyside. Late at night on Saturday the 9th of July, the store's manager was woken at home by armed men who handcuffed him and bundled him out of his house. They drove him 20 miles to the supermarket where he was forced to help the robbers open the safe and they stole about £8,000. Tony Bailey's been taking calls with his colleagues all evening. Um, what sort of response have you had so far? We've had a very good response. They should be both in the studio and in um, the police station in Liverpool. Um, we're checking on a lot of the leads that we've had given. We've had a lot of names given to us and of course there's still an awful lot of work to be done on in relation to the calls that have uh, come in. Any news on the cars? Nothing at all at the moment on the identification of the cars, but someone has pointed out to us that um, a few C-registered cars, a very small few, of 1.8 cc. Also, I just have Granada. Uh, one, on. yes, 1800, I should say, cc. Right. Just had Granada on them and nothing else. Right. Could we have a recap on the descriptions <clears throat> of the robbers? Yes, the two white males, both about 30, 35 years of age, dark hair, five foot six to seven tall fat to stocky build. Uh, but has anybody come forward to say that they saw the tall, thin manager and the short, fat robber together on those early hours of Saturday the 9th and Sunday the 10th of July? No, not as yet. And we, as we showed on the reconstruction, there was some of the past them at that time and we would love that man to come forward to um, tell us about it. Right. There must have been a lot of people around at that time. The nightclubs were just closing, so please do contact us if you can. John Bly has been with us tonight with a treasure trove of property. In fact, perhaps the best Aladdin's cave we've ever had. And it seems that uh, some of you have recognised quite a lot of it, John. Yes, indeed. Very good. The musical box, the stick barometer and the tankard and the mug have all been positively identified. So too is this little teapot, these wonderful candlesticks and, of course, my favourite table. And now I've been asked to show you again these two miniatures of gentlemen in red coats. And to help you identify them, the bottom one nearest to you is signed and dated 1772. Now, I've just had positive identification on the child's chair at the back, and I've been asked to remind you that all the items here are less than 5% of all the things that have been recovered, and the rest can be seen at the Guildford and Walton-on-Thames police stations. Well, now those attacks on uh, elderly women living alone in Surrey and in the north of Sussex. Police asked Cranwich to help to try to trace a man who uh, had been striking late on Friday nights. And they think he selects his victim by spying on them as a peeping Tom. Inspector George Smith, uh, again, you've had a lot of calls, but how good have they been in quality? I'm very encouraged. Over 30 calls received here, some 60, in fact, at the incident room. And they have, in fact, asked me to stress that if people haven't been able to get through, please keep phoning, the room will stay open. We had an artist's impression. I gather you've got a number of names put to that. Yes, several uh, callers have phoned and says we recognise that impression. But more than that, they've given very important positive information which will require follow-up inquiries in the morning. But does this fit the profile? Remember, all these attacks, of course, are late on Friday nights, early Saturday mornings. Have people been able to identify 
people who might have reasons to be striking at that time. That is a very encouraging thing. Yes, they've given reasons why a certain Mr. So and so could only visit these at these uh, locations on a Friday night. And how many of them conform to that FBI psychological profile of, of a loner, someone who probably lived with someone who who is fairly elderly? Some do, some don't, but as we've stressed, that is only a theory, only a suggestion. If you have a suspect and he doesn't fit that uh, pattern, please phone, we still need to know. Well, viewers have already given you a lot of work to do, I gather. Thank you. Okay, Mr Smith, thank you. Sue? Well, now let's see what calls we've had for incident desk cases and photo call. Here's David Hatcher again. First of all, did anyone recognise the man or the crossbow which killed Diana Moore? Yes, yeah, somebody thinks they recognised the man, Sue. Called into Ealing Police Station and says and, and given details that match that video fit and the rest of the man's description very well. And we'd like that person to call again, please. We must speak to you. We're sure that you know more that will help us locate him and uh, pinpoint him now. We think he's an Ealing local. All right. I know we've had many calls on the Canterbury rapist. Did anybody suggest a name for him for that artist's impression we showed? Again, we've had a number of leads to follow up there with many more names suggested. This was a tragic case of an 11 year and an 11-year-old and 9-year-old girls being raped. We must trace him. If you know where he is or you think you know him, still call us, please. What about those Burberries? Yes, over 30 calls there, including three police officers who's given, who've given names that say they match the video fit uh, and have also been responsible for similar offences in the past. So that could be promising. Right. And there was a man with uh, too many names to mention, wanted in connection with frauds all over the country. Yes, again, at least three more people since Crime Watch have realised that they too have been conned by this guy. Uh, and we've also got what appears to be reliable information telling us that he was sighted in Fordingbridge, Hampshire, last night. Uh, and that we also think he's now using the name Talbot. Again, if you know where he is at this moment, call. Finally, what news on photo call? Well, the Barry Mackay, we were seeking him to talk to him about the murder of Elaine McGee. Numerous possible sightings, including very recent ones. Again, if you know where that man is now, still call, though. And lastly, this woman we were seeking in relation to uh, frauds at Thomas Cook, where she got away with traveller's checks. Again, sightings and possible names of her, including from three police officers again, not the same officers, and uh, we may be able to pinpoint her. Right, David, thank you. We've also just heard that uh, the priceless tapestry we showed on Aladdin's cave has been identified as coming from a museum in Bolton, so that's good news there too. Indeed, there's more information uh, coming in right now. That is it, though, I'm afraid, for tonight. Uh, the line's here to the studio. Well, it's after midnight, so they've now closed, but we'll show you all the relevant police numbers in just a moment. And, of course, you can always phone your local police, or you can write to us here at Crime Watch UK, BBC Television, London, W12 8QT. We'll be back in a month from now on Thursday the 6th of October. Meanwhile, don't have nightmares, do please. Sleep well. Good night. Good night. Yeah.